Thank you for the invitation. Good afternoon, everyone. I thought I would uh, give it a different twist today by highlighting the importance of grassroots movements uh, into the climate change uh, question. And the way I designed my presentation is basically addressing the top six questions that you, that you sent us and that you, that you want us to discuss uh, in the discussion section later on. So I will start with the first question of what are the most relevant knowledge research gaps uh, regarding climate change and human health at the level of the country and the region. Of course, we talked a lot about the region, but I would like to focus a little bit on what are the research gaps in Lebanon. And starting by saying that business as usual can no longer continue. Uh, in Lebanon, unfortunately, and I'm really not happy to report that the country has been really uh, crippled by, by a lot of uh, problems, including corruption. And that's why we have lack of infrastructure for clean and renewable energy. We also don't have electricity 24 over 24 because of uh, the uh, lack of supplying electricity to people. And so people replace this by uh, acquiring their own small generators. And what you see in the picture here is the height. So again, I mean, I'm not going to repeat that. I designed the presentation around the sub top six questions. Let's go to the first question. Uh, so. Uh, what we can see is the lack of infrastructure uh, for clean and renewable energy. Mainly, there is a short supply in electricity, and people have subsidized this by local diesel generators that have filled up the city in a density of 50%, uh, meaning we have lots of PM2.5, black carbon, and carcinogen emissions from these diesel generators. We have an, a great need for effective and expedited mitigation measures. There is an impact of climate change on women's health and the most vulnerable. And we saw a major migration flux in the past two years because of the economic collapse, among other things. Uh, uh, if you can uh, click, please. Uh, I'm not going to. Uh, in, you know, say uh, a lot about the regional challenges, but I will say one thing is that our re uh, reactive oxygen species measures uh, of uh, dust particles has shown also toxicity the same way as urban and anthropogenic particles, meaning our presence next to two major deserts here uh, does not mean that biogenic emissions do not come with some health impact. And with the increase of desert uh, storms, uh, maybe the health impact is also going to be affected. So we go to the second slide, please. Uh, what is already happening at the local level in terms of policy? Not much. And so if we click, we can see that we have done some work as uh, air pollution specialist with emergency department admission. And we saw that among uh, kids and among adults, we see a huge increase in the past uh, 10 years, an increase in the viral infection in some uh, disorders related to women reproductive systems and, and influenza, and, and influenza, of course. And uh, if you can click, please. Um, we also thought that the only way we can raise awareness about air pollution is to encourage uh, medical doctors to incorporate some of the questions about air pollution in their diagnostics. And for that, we surveyed 125 health professional people and asked them whether they feel confident about asking their patients questions about air pollution. And the results showed that very few feel confident about this. And later, I will show how these same health professionals actually required or ask for support and awareness materials that they can incorporate or learn about before they ask their patients. So, number three, please. In terms of what policy actions can we take at the national level and at the regional level, I am really pleased to see this discussion going to taking place because we did some analysis of why 
in uh, in European countries, there is a higher compliance to uh, to the uh, recommendations and to lowering the air pollution. Among other things, of course, there are so many factors, but among other things, there is the two layers, or we would say several layers of uh, enforcement or law enforcement, one coming from the local government, but also another one coming from the EU Commission. In our region, we have yet to see something like this, where uh, countries who do not comply, who do not attempt to lower air pollution, uh, are not put uh, on the spot or are not pressured by neighboring countries. And I think this will be of great help. Uh, number four, please. Uh, uh, so with number four, if, uh, if policy makers, uh, how, how would they do in order to address the problem of climate change and help and health? So, uh, Kami, if you can click here, there are several layers. So we can go government or uh, uh, strategy alone. Public private partnership is also one option. Academia private public partnership. And the most of all, our experience has shown that academia, private, public, and community partnership has been very effective in our case, especially in the uh, in the absence of stringent regulations and pol uh, and policy decisions from the part of the government. So, if you can click again, please, we can see. Uh, that we have created a model where we can look into the local climate change challenges from a community perspective, where we come in with uh, uh, a transdisciplinary approach. Uh, we democratize the knowledge by putting in the hands of the citizens the tools and the information that they need to know in order for themselves to see the problem and decide to take action. Every local community has its own context, and we realize that. And the most important uh, important thing is that unlike uh, funding agencies who come and build capacity and they leave after the funding uh, uh, finishes, we have been uh, at the Nature Conservation Center at the American University of Beirut next to our communities for the past 10 years, and we felt that this is uh, this is uh, has been effective. And what we want to uh, emphasize here is that we don't do it in the absence or without engaging public and policy officials. In the contrary, we empower the community and we ask the policymakers to get engaged whenever they are needed. Number five, please. And so, uh, also, if you can click here, there are four clicks. Mm. Uh, so, uh, thank you. Uh, so, in the public engagement, we have monitored uh, through those programs that we have uh, at the university, several stakeholders that will be of main importance in influencing and pushing the changes to happen. And the uh, uh, major players that are basically that have the highest level of interest, interest and willingness to change are the community members, the, the scholar activists that we like to call them the experts, uh, the private sector, if they have a vested interest in that, in that, and most importantly, putting the science in the hands of the, of the citizens has shown to be a very powerful tool. And so climate change challenges and solutions in our opinion or in our context have shown to be uh, to be efficient, to be driven or demanded by by the local communities. If you can click one thing, please. And I saw one of our colleagues mentioned that they we need the communication is very important, and we have tested, and we are under the Environment Academy program, teaming up with a very prominent TV station in the local uh, uh, in the uh, at the local uh, level, and we saw that. Uh, the TV plays a major role in mobilizing the community as well as the public authorities. And we have created between the public authorities and the community some type of a social contract so that the community members can hold accountable people, public officials, if they don't reply and act 
in terms of uh, providing them with their demand, including good health and good uh, livelihood. And finally, last, uh, lastly, I would love to talk about the joined up policy and the joined up can have several layer, uh, la layers. So if you can click here, Camille, please, uh, the layers here that we would like to add and uh, they are at the uh, academia level, they are the uh, collaborations in, among the different disciplines. And what I would like to talk about here is a collaboration between air pollution specialist and analytical chemist, that is myself, and a group or of cardiovascular disease medical doctors. And uh, we collected urine samples from several patients who reported to the cardiovascular uh, unit for catheterization. And what we found is that people, even if they don't have the coronary artery disease, they have shown markers of air pollution in their urine, and this is worrisome. Uh, if you can click more, please. So uh, that's why we asked, uh, uh, we asked medical doctors if they will be supporting uh, some kind of awareness and some kind of questionnaire uh, to include in the diagnostic. And you see here between strongly support and support, we have over 50% of the medical doctors in support of this initiative. And last but not least, if we can click one more, we believe that the knowledge production or co-production by the community aided or supported by prediction models, citizen science, public participatory approach, scholar activism, and decision tools, which all rely heavily on applied research, can be of a great help for the community to push towards uh, policies that are of great benefit to the community by providing uh, the by establishing this contact with a contact between uh, or this rapport between the community and policy. I want to thank you, and this is I tried to attempt to answer those questions. I mean, I have some comments over the other questions, but we'll get to the discussion. Thank you.